so far, most of the examples we've used are fairly uniform. So we're not really tending high or tending low, tending up, tending down, but that doesn't have to be the case. And in fact, interesting things happen when it's not the case. It would be a boring world if everything were always equally likely. Let's talk about that in the context of a continuous random variable where the probability of getting any single value is zero. So here's some number line, and I'm gonna choose some random numbers on this number line. Value one, value two, value three, value four, value five, value six. And I'm gonna do this a bunch of times and record all of the values I get. So the probability of getting any single one of those values was zero, but I can see that there's a clustering that this seems to be like more popular on the bottom, that more of my values are towards the bottom than are towards the top, and none of them are in the middle. So again, sit with this discomfort. The probability of getting this dot was zero, and the probability of getting this dot was zero, but somehow the area near the left dot was more likely than the area near the right dot. The way we're going to measure this is with a density. And this is the same density that you might have heard in physics or chemistry. It's how much stuff divided by how much space. So in this case, I can count, say, the number of dots per centimeter. If I count up the number of dots per centimeter, that gives me the density. And I can see that the left is more dense than the right. So if I were going to plot that density, it's some high number here, some large number of dots per centimeter, and then zero dots per centimeter, and then some medium number of dots per centimeter. Just to get used to this idea of density, I want to show you a few more dot diagrams and what their density function might look like. This is a fairly uniform density. It's hard with random variables because they do tend to cluster a little bit, but there's not a clear area that's thicker than the other areas. So I would say this probability density is constant. It's equally dense in all of these places. And then of course it's zero here and zero here. So this probability density function might look something like this. Here's another example. It's really dense here. It's got a high density. Dots per centimeter is large. It's less dense here. It's got a lower density, fewer dots per centimeter, and then zero dots per centimeter, zero and zero. So that's what this probability density function might look like. And we can have a gradient as well. So I have lots of dots per centimeter here, and then fewer dots per centimeter, and then fewer dots per centimeter. So you could have something like a gradient as well, where the density is not just constant, it's decreasing. Now that we have the idea behind probability density, let's talk about actually computing it. So if I want to know the number of points divided by the length of the interval, that's a good start. That'll tell me the density. But there's an issue with it, which is that I could do this random process as many times as I wanted. So if I did it a hundred times, I get one density. If I did it a thousand times, I get a totally different density because now I have 10 times as many points over the same interval. So it's maybe not the number of points, it's maybe the like percentage of points. So maybe a slightly better way to compute this would be something like the percentage of the total points in the interval divided by the length of the interval. And percentage of total points in the interval, well, that's kind of like the probability of being in that interval. So this is our idea for measuring density, for instead of just having vaguely high or lower, for putting an actual number on the density. So let's think about this in terms of the cumulative distribution function on a small interval. So let's say I'm taking my interval from some number x to some number that's a little bit beyond x, say it's at x plus h. Then I want to figure out the probability that my variable ends up between x and x plus h. I'm going to divide that by the length of the interval, which is h. Using the cumulative distribution function, this is big F of x plus h minus big F of x. Remember, big F of x plus h captures everybody less than x plus h. And then big F of x captures everybody less than x. I want what's in between. And now if h is small, well, this should remind you of something. This is the definition of the derivative if h is going to 0. 
So, I told you the cumulative distribution function would come in handy later. If we differentiate it, we can measure how densely packed these events are around a particular area. So again, the odds of hitting, say, 1.2 are zero, but I can say that near 1.2, I'm less likely to find something than near, say, negative one. That's what the probability density function allows us to express. It's the derivative of the cumulative distribution function, which we've been writing as capital F. And so we usually write the probability density function as lowercase f. And in fact, this is how we're going to define the probability density function. I'm going to just define it as the derivative of the cumulative distribution function where it exists.